uh, my uh, friend is, uh, my initial friend in family practice was Dr. Joe Pope, and he is a beekeeper also, and he kept saying, you can't be an entomologist without raising bees. And so, anyway, and I had absolutely no knowledge of bees, believe it or not. You get a PhD in entomology and you're going, ah, I should know something about bees, but I didn't. So, anyway, and then I also have a minor background in statistics, so I got involved in the study initially to help with uh, setting up the trial and randomization with that. So, um, I'll seems to be what the NIH is looking for anymore are collaborative efforts between colleges and hospitals and, and family practices and things like that. And so it was that was very surprising to me that it was that the grant went through with very little problems with it. And so um, it allowed me also to have a couple of students working with me, which is at San Juan College. It's a small community college and. Uh, we try to provide our students, our science students, with opportunities to do undergraduate research. And so that was the other thing I was looking for also. So anyway, I had a couple of students working with me this summer. Brighton Baker, uh, who was working primarily with the, uh, the pollen <coughs> aspect and the flower aspect of, of our study. And then Holly Van Deber is um, a chemistry student. She just recently graduated with a degree in chemistry and uh, she's going to be doing environmental chemistry at Fort Lewis College after this. And then Dr. Eric Miller was my uh, advisor with the chemical analysis that I was doing. So anyway, let's see here if I can find this. Okay. As all good studies, you should start out with some sort of a hypothesis. And This happened to me a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I was giving this talk, and uh, I wound up at the very beginning of the presentation. But anyway, um, our hypothesis was is that locally produced clinical honey currently being used, investigated in the treatment of our MRSA um, is a single source or single pollen source from Russian knapweed and the primary antibacterial compound should be methyl glyoxyl. Um, once again, methyl glyoxyl is, a known, is known from a medically recognized honey and, of course, the New Zealand Manuka honey. So this is what we were starting out with. We were thinking this is a single pollen source honey and it should have the methyl glyoxyl in it. The objectives were to identify the primary floral sources, the pollen and nectar of the local clinical honey, identify and quantify a known antibacterial compound, in other words, the methyl glyoxyl, and then add, investigate the antibiotic components of the nectar from Russian knapweed. So this is what we initially set out. And so the methods, survey and collect pollen from floral sources in areas surrounding study area beehives, prepare and observe pollen using light and electron microscopy. This is something interesting, San Juan College for a small community college has a lot of really nice equipment. We do have a scanning electron microscope, which I'm very proud of. And um, we also have a really nice fluorescent microscope that we can use too. But we also wanted to quantify the uh, pollen that was in the honey that we were using too. So anyway, um, the initial part of this study was uh, looking at the, at the um, having trouble reading my slides up there. The initial part that I would like to look at here is the chemical analysis that we did. And it says something kind of interesting up there. It says solid phase micro extraction techniques. This was really kind of an interesting thing. Um, whenever you're using gas chromatography to try and identify components of honey, um, it's very difficult to actually be able to extract what you want out of that to look at it in a gas chromatograph. Most people use HPLC, which is a different technique. It's high-pressure liquid chromatography. 
And so there's very little literature on how do you actually prepare your samples to look at. So we spent about four weeks initially trying to go through some of the older techniques of preparing the honey to be able to look at with our gas chromatograph. We ran the first couple of samples through and they were contaminated with a lot of the reagents that we had been using, some of the components of the reagents. And so um, we sort of got frustrated with this and I had my, um, my chemist student go back to the library and look to see if she could find some newer techniques on looking at this and she came up with a fairly new technique that is called solid phase micro extraction which it sounds like a big name but all that it is it's a it's a little carbon fiber that has been treated with various types of rosins which are specific for different chemicals so you can actually just dip this little fiber down into the honey leave it in the honey for um, about uh, 10 minutes, take it out, and you can put it directly into the gas chromatograph and analyze what you have. And so we'd spent four weeks doing something that took us all of about eight hours to complete uh, after we decided to use this new technique. So it's kind of kind of interesting. And so anyway, we got everything prepared for that. So. Now then, I would like to, I'll go back and look at the chemical stuff here in a minute, but I'd like to look at what we found with the pollen first here. Uh, we were primarily interested in Russian knapweed. How many people have observed Russian knapweed before? So, it's not really something that most people like having around. I think it's listed as one of the top ten noxious weeds in the United States, which I find kind of interesting. And it's something that is uh, grows along the river, the San Juan and Animas rivers in Farmington, the Platter River. It uh, grows along the irrigation ditches. It seems to be in lots of people's fields. And most people say, how am I going to get rid of this stuff? Well, interestingly enough, bees really, really like the flowers. And so I, I tend to say, well, why don't we think about uh, preserving it before we kill it all off? But anyway, this is kind of what the flower looks like. And let's see if I can get the laser to work. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, right here is an individual little flower and all these little individual flowers. The Russian knapweed belongs to the Asteraceae or the Compositae family, which is like sunflowers. And so, every one of those little things you see sticking up there is an individual little flower, and they're very small. And so one of the problems that we had to be faced with is how do you get nectar out of something that's that small? And so anyway, and then another flower that we were looking at was uh, coyote willow, and the flowers are even smaller on it. And so we decided the Russian knapweed was the best thing to work with last summer. And so anyway, these are the pollens that we, uh, that we know were in the honey. Uh, there's musk thistle, four-winged saltbush, coyote willow. There's another musk thistle that is a different color variation. And so the percentages, we just added the two up to get our percentages of musk thistle. And then the Russian knapweed pollen and then the tamarisk pollen, our salt cedar. Those are the ones that we know of uh, being in the clinical honey that we're using. Um, this is just a slide showing what the pollens look like. They all have different shapes and different characteristics. And um, being an entomologist, I'm used to identifying and keying things out. But uh, at the same time, I discovered that I wasn't very good at being able to key pollen grains out. They all tend to look alike whenever you first look at them. But anyway, the one on the left is the Russian knapweed pollen, which is a larger pollen than the coyote willow pollen over on the right over there. With our pollen study, uh, I'll just read through the important part of this. 37% uh, of the pollen was Russian knapweed. 14% uh, was the four-wing saltbush. Uh, tamarisk made up a, uh, about 2%. Uh, coyote willow was 32%. Um, and then the musk thistle was about 15%. And so as you can see, the musk thistle, the cowty willow, and the Russian knapweed were the primary pollens. 
Clinical honey was identified instead of single source as a multiple floral source honey with Russian knapweed pollen and coyote willow pollens being significant components, along with, of course, four other pollen sources. Uh, we only investigated the Russian knapweed this last summer and we'll extend that study to the other components this coming summer. Now then, my chemical analysis. Uh, I'll just go through this very quickly. If you look at the Manuka honey, what we found, of course, was the methyl glyoxyl was the primary component. We did not find any other antibacterial or any antifungal compounds in the Manuka honey. In our clinical honey, we had the methyl glyoxyl, which we expected to see, but we also found another chemical called furfural. Uh, furfural is kind of interesting. You find it in cinnamon. In fact, uh, they, the studies that I've read said that cinnamon has its unique flavor and smell due to the furfural. Uh, furfural is a known antibacterial and antifungal compound, and when people are looking at using hybrid poplar trees uh, for um, as a oil source, um, they have to actually be able to account for the fact that, um, that the hybrid poplars have a high content of furfural, which kills the bacteria used for digesting the, the poplars. And so I think that's got really kind of interesting. It's not, a, it's not a <coughs> uncommon compound, but it was just surprising to find it in the honey. Um, when we looked at the Russian knapweed floral extract, we didn't find anything that we were expecting to find. There were no antibacterial or uh, antifungal compounds that were in that. But we did find something that I just thought that I'd mention was very interesting. Up at the top, that chemical called topotecan is an anti-cancer -com compound. It's a known anti-cancer -ca compound of botanical origin. And it has only been identified in uh, a particular plant species from, uh, from China. And so here we're finding it in a whole floral extract of Russian gnat wheat, which I find is really kind of interesting. That particular chemical inhibits DNA from replicating properly. So it was like, well, uh, it's not showing up in the honey, fortunately, but uh, it does show up in a whole floral extract of Russian gnat wheat, which I think is very interesting. Uh, it probably doesn't show up in the Russian knapweed nectar, but uh, it does show up in the rest of the floral parts, so, so I think that's interesting. Our chemical analysis results, or methyl glyoxyl, was identified in the clinical honey. Secondary compound furfural was also identified, and then, of course, that anti-cancer compound was identified in the Russian knapweed flower. So, I think that that's interesting that people get really excited about getting rid of the Russian knapweed. And not only do the bees really like it, but it also, the, the flowers, have a anti-cancer compound in it. And so I, I think maybe we should rethink our ideas about Russian knapweed sometimes. We'd like to be able to further investigate floral sources of honey in New Mexico. Right now, we do not have funding for being able to do that, but I'd eventually like to be able to look at some of the other honeys, um, do the chemical analysis with it. We'd also like to extend our, chemical, our in vitro studies for other honeys. Um, and one of the things that we are going to stress this year in our research, and I'll finish out with this, is that we did not have an opportunity to actually quantify. We know what chemicals are in the honey, but we were not able to have enough time to quantify that. And so our research this summer is going to be aimed uh, primarily at quantifying the uh, amount of methyl glyoxyl and furfural in our honey. So anyway, uh, I think I have some contact information up there. So, if anyone has any questions, well, I think, no, do we still have time? Okay, good. Uh, yes, uh, is there a possibility of your getting further grants from the National Institute of Health 
Yes, this current grant that I have uh, has another three years uh, with that, and I have been encouraged to apply for um, a different type of NIH grant, which would provide a whole lot more funding uh, for that. And so the one that I have right now is primarily, primarily aimed at being able to provide undergraduate research students an opportunity. And so the other one is actually a full-blown research grant, and so and I've been highly encouraged to do that. So, one second question was, uh, how much of the honey did you apply? Like with a sterile swab, you put on. That, that's a very good question. Uh, we apply as much as we can, uh, up to 15 milliliters. But it depends on the size of the abscess. Smaller ones, you just can't get that much of the wound. But uh, we, we, we have that range uh, of up to 15. And uh, in honey for wounds, is not always possible every location. It's hard to do on the face, on uh, extremities, you know, on the feet and hands. So there are some limitations. But wherever we can, we just get as much and just put as much on there as the wound bandage will hold. And we also try to incorporate what is called the cellulitis around the wound. You, usually with abscess, you've got the primary abscess, but often a larger area. And so we try to cover as much of that as possible. I might also just say, if I could real quick, meta honey is, I think sometimes, medicine's unintentional best kept secret. So, if you have any family members, you should keep meta honey instead of wasting money on Neosporin and the other over-the-counter ones. You know, it is so much better. We have our pharmacy carrying it, uh, or a pharmacy carrying close to us. The tube of meta honey uh, costs about $24, but I think it's a good investment. I just kind of think, you know, for cuts and stuff, don't leave home without it. It's, it's really good. <coughs> um, hi, thank you for your very interesting presentation. Um, the methicillin, is that the primary treatment for uh, the staph or the abscess? And are there other um, antibiotics that are, are used uh, generally for that uh, treatment of that abscess? And is the honey more efficacious? Well, that's what we're trying to find out, how it compares. In our study, we're using Bactrim as an antibiotic. But for MRSA seed, Bactrim, uh, Clindamycin, uh, Tetracycline, they're just not great medications for penetration. I think that's an issue. Now, the staff that are sensitive, Keflex and Cephalosporins, have much better tissue penetration. But that's a problem with MRSA is that, of course, they're resistant to those, not only methicillin, but all, pretty much all the cephalosporins in the class of antibiotics. So you talked about meta honey, and what I didn't see was, and maybe you showed it, was um, what is specific about this meta honey as opposed to, from New Zealand, as opposed to your local honey? It almost looked like your local honey, at least from your data, showed it being more effective than the meta honey. Well, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, on the, on the you know, it's, it's a, a rough estimate on the um, Kirby Bauer disc, and it seemed to be that there was a, um, somewhat better on the clinical, but still, the Muddy Honey is, is well known, and it had a nice zone of inhibition as well. I thought I would just add this to it, is that um, our honey, our local honey that we're using, uh, indeed has two different uh, anti-antibiotic uh, components to it. And I think that that may be helping a lot also. I know that um, just as kind of anecdotal is that I have um, type 2 diabetes and one of the things that I have a problem with is whenever I have a wound is having secondary fungal infections associated with it. And I cannot, of course, be a part of the, of the clinical study, but I do know that whenever I use the local honey to treat those infections, that they heal much, much faster. And I think it's because it has the two components in it. The furfural actually has antifungal 
activity as well as antibacterial. So, um, so I, I don't know. That, that's the way that I'm leaning is that we have two components that are, that are really helping to act together. I think that probably everyone would agree that a lot of times you have secondary fungal infections that follow along with the bacterial ones too. So, I don't know. Have you um, broken down the meta honey into the same kind of components as you have the local honey? Because it would be nice to see yes. that side by side. Uh, well, that's kind of what I was trying to show up there is, is that the, uh, the meta honey does not have the antifungal compound in it, whereas the, um, our local honey does. I, let me run the slide back here. Uh, this, is the, this is the Manuka honey up here, and this is just a snapshot of some of the compounds that we found. But the primary one that we found in that was of course, the methyl glyoxal, which we expected that we would find. And, but we did not find anything else. And then if you look at the clinical honey, we found uh, two compounds. We found the methyl glyoxal and then the furfural in addition to that. And then, like I said, we were interested in, in the Russian knapweed, and it was really hard to get a pure nectar out of that. I still am trying to work with capillary tubes and stuff to see if I can get do, better at doing that. So we just did a whole floral extract of that. And so we didn't find any antibacterial or antifungal compounds in, in the whole floral extract, but we did have that surprising point. So I don't know, did that answer your question? Or? Okay. So I'm sold. Where do we get some? <laughs> Well, it's just uh, just for research, actually. I get asked that. I want to stay with that, uh, so we learn more. But I really the I'm <laughs> I'm pr pr promoting the manuka meta honey. It's available. It's pharmaceutical. You know, it's store. So I think it has a s similar advantages. Not uh, exactly the same, probably, but still. For all intents and purposes, clinically, I think that's the way to go, and we'll, we want to keep, as Dr. Hyder was saying, we want to keep learning more, more about this floral source, maybe other floral sources. What? I'm sorry. Do you have a feeling for whether other species, uh, at Centauria species, are going to have similar properties because we do have a native New Mexico uh, thistle that is not an invasive species. And then, of course, we have right. at least five, I think, other invasive <laughs> thistles <laughs> that everybody's trying to get rid of. Um, and maybe just, you know, a question. And also, it, could you go back to the slide with the, the petri dish on it uh, when we're finished? Yes. Uh, let's see. This one? Yeah. That slide, that particular slide? Yeah. Okay. I did some research on turmeric honey, or not turmeric. Um, what's the local invasive species here in Arizona? Tamarisk? I did some research on tamarisk and found that it's one of the most prized medicinal honeys in France and I know it's being eradicated here and, and the eradication process is also killing off a lot of bees along the Rio Grande. Do you have any plans to do some test on that before it is eradicated? Um, I, that, that is included in this summer's studies is that that was one, one of the pollens and that was one of the floral sources that we wanted to be able to look at. And I don't know, don't know if you remember looking at the slide up there, but um, let me see, I'll find it here. <clears throat> Is that we did have uh, tamarisk or salt cedar that was actually um, a, a component of our honey. And so, what I want to do this year is I want to look at the uh, the coyote willow and the musk thistle. We'll look at the tamarisk and the four-wing saltbush also. We'll look at those uh, floral extracts from those also. And um, one of my students, um, the um, chemist student, Holly, 
um, is Native American. She's Navajo, and uh, she had a, a an infected spider bite this summer. And her grandfather, who is a uh, traditional medicine man, actually used a paste that he had mixed up with coyote willow, and it healed very, very rapidly. And so I think that that is going to be well worth looking at the coyote willow and the tamarisk also. So, but anyway, we're going to be doing that. So. And what would be the best way for us to keep track of your research? <laughs> hmm. That's an interesting question. <laughs> I think that the best thing to do would be to uh, don't hesitate to email me. And um, I'll put my, our emails up here. Um, oh, good grief. There it is. There, I'm horrible. Things. I teach class every day. I prefer the our whiteboards over the PowerPoints, though. <laughs> so, but um, anyway, um, I am planning on being able to publish this information um, that, this coming fall. We should have enough results whenever, whenever we do the quantification uh, to publish. Um, I'll also be publishing a separate study, a study on the pollens. Um, Pollens have not been very well documented, in my opinion, and so I want to make sure that we actually publish as a separate paper the pollen part of the study. And so anyway, I but just don't hesitate to send me an email. I am fairly responsive to those. So does that does that help? Yeah, the question I was just going to tag on to that is when are you publishing? And mostly you'll be publishing in probably medical journals. But, uh, no? Well, we need, we need more patients for sure because the numbers are low. We just had one of the surgeons uh, in Farmington uh, sign, you know, take the training. And so hopefully we'll have more patients. And yeah, that would, those, that would be medical journals. Because that, that kind of information would be, I think, really important to share with. New Mexico Agricultural Department or all the localities or municipalities that mm -hmm. continue to destroy the beleaguered weeds of New Mexico, which right. actually have <laughs> such medicinal properties. It's a shame. I know. Um, another place that I plan that I would really like to publish in would be the uh, would be the Bee Journal, and there's also another journal that is called Carbohydrate Research, which most most people wouldn't have access to that, but. Probably the Bee Journal is one of the ones that I really like to get some of this information into. So, research on pollen? I've not planned that right now, but that's something that has been mentioned to me on a number of occasions and something I would be very interested in. So, what, what do you think about it? Uh, yeah, I think we're kind of sometimes having a challenge to keep up with what we're doing right now, but that would be of interest for sure. On your uh, disc where you did the samples, the other honey samples, were those both store-bought? Those were they... from one of the natural uh, grocery stores in Farmington. Just, yeah. And they were locally sourced, do you know? Or I don't recall that. I just, it wasn't one of the, it would be like a health food store. But I don't know. I don't, that's a good question. I don't know where exactly it came from. I just thought I would mention this, the Manuka honey that we used in the study was not the Meta honey. Uh, it was actually a jar of Manuka honey that I had uh, purchased and interestingly enough for just a very, very small little jar, it was like about $38, <laughs> which I, I was really astounded at how much that it was. <laughs> so anyway, but it was not, it had not been formulated as a medical honey. So. I think the only thing that I noticed on it that was different is that it had been actually pasteurized. But, yes. Oh, well. I think the meta honey would be more stringent on that, but because it is. Can, can she repeat that question? We can't hear the question that she asked. The question was about uh, eucalyptus source of uh, being identified as a source of honey labeled as manuka. Is that correct? Yeah. 
uh, the American Apotherapy Society has a journal and they publish studies like this all the time. I'm sure they would be delighted to publish your results. Do you, do you think there are other people that are doing any of the kind of research you are? Because I lived in New Zealand and I know they've used plenty of money for decades. And here we have plants that are as good or better. And my guess is they're all over the world, but nobody was doing the research. Yeah, I just found the, uh, the part there about Africa and I think Ireland, they did some testing. Um, I don't know the clinical studies though. I haven't seen that, but I think further exploration of the floral source. Um, I had the opportunity to meet a person from, as a, he's a botanist at Harvard University, and um, talked with him about his work over in China on their large botanical, their floral project that they did. And, uh, they were looking specifically for anti-cancer compounds along with the floral identification. And so, but I was talking to him about our project and he was saying that a lot of these um, plants had never been looked at for any sort of antibacterial or antifungal properties. And, you know, most people are going, oh yeah, cancer, that's where the money is going to be for that. But I, I find very little work where, where people have looked at different floral sources, and so I think that that's really kind of kind of interesting. I would like to see that expanded myself. But. <coughs>